I'm here with Andrea Yon Kojikaru, a licensed architect and software developer who co-founded a company called Yumina. She's an expert in virtual architecture, and that's what we'll be talking about today, as well as a wider range of subjects. So what would you say the principal differences are in designing for real world spaces and virtual spaces? Gravity. Real architects have quite a hard time in the beginning designing for virtual reality because we have spent not only our entire education, but sometimes our entire career developing an intuition for what it means to design physical spaces. Um, and everything comes down to the logic of the structure and the weight that has to come down and this idea that the best designs are able to marry the structural needs and construction needs of a building with art and some kind of poetic idea about the expression of space. But the two always have to be intertwined. Um, so we spent our entire lives um, understanding what this means and trying to develop a spatial and a design vocabulary to answer this challenge. So when we have to design for the virtual environment, all of a sudden, um, we, we are faced with something that's quite different, actually. There is no gravity. Um, there is no structure. So what does, this, what does that mean? What are the constraints of virtual space? Are there really no constraints? Is it, is it like you can design anything you want? And if you go through that exercise, you will very quickly discover that when there are no constraints and you can design really anything you want, um, you kind of get stuck very fast, right? Because a design problem or exercise or project should always have some kind of goal and constraints. So the next question then that comes up is, okay, what should the goals be of virtual architecture and what are some of the constraints? So the real world has this constraint of gravity. And when designers come into virtual reality, they're kind of baking in that assumption from the start. H how do you suggest they start to think about the new environment that virtual spaces allow for? And how, how do you suggest that they start to think around the constraints of reality that they bring into virtual spaces? The start point for me is always, what is the goal of the virtual space? because it has to fulfill some kind of purpose. Um, the way real architecture is functional, I also like to think of virtual architecture as being functional. So, so why do we need it? And um, the first answer here is because we need it to serve certain kind of psychological needs, like space influences our psychology in certain ways. Um, and we also needed to also fulfill certain kind of functions, but those have a very different relationship to people um, and to behavior and to what is going on in that space than in physical architecture. Um, so, and, e and each project and each virtual world has different answers to these, these questions. Um, so I would say what kind of what kind of relationship should should be established between what happens in the virtual world the people or the avatars in there and the virtual space and unfortunately i see a lot of examples where that relationship is a very passive one so architecture virtual architecture is used as a backdrop um so you have the, the project managers that come up with the concept of what happens in that virtual world. You have the programmers that kind of put in awesome functionality. And then the, the designers or the architects come in and create some kind of beautiful backdrop that just looks nice. They're not part of the conversation about functionality. But if we were to learn something from physical architecture, Physical architecture has a very clear relationship to the functionality, to what is supposed to happen. Um, the, that space is supposed to accommodate activities. And if it's poorly designed, it actually um, does a disservice. Uh, and you, we can even go one step further, which is if you think of things like the layout of your apartment, it's actually 
um, encouraging you to live life in a certain kind of way. The relationship between your kitchen and the bedrooms and the hallway influences what you do every day and, and, and a certain daily kind of um, outline of behaviors. Uh, so, so it is quite a big deal. And if you look at the history of architecture, you see how we used to have, uh, we used to conceptualize of the space of a bedroom in relationship to a hallway in a very different way. Actually, 200 years ago, there are almost no hallways in architecture. It's actually a modern invention. And daily life used to be very different because of that in a building. Um, and my personal goal is to address this topic so that when when designers start to think of about their virtual worlds, they see virtual architecture as something that should be part of the conversation of functionality from the very beginning, not an afterthought that gets added to make things look pretty. A lot of the public spaces in, in the real world that people tend to frequent are designed by public organizations for public benefit. Do you think there's a kind of conflict in VR in that a lot of these spaces and the most popular announced spaces are designed by large corporations to kind of fulfill their their goals rather than designed around the user? I I honestly believe that a lot of examples we see, um, the architecture is not really designed almost at all. Is just skeuomorphism. So you see screenshots all over LinkedIn, for example, from this corporate virtual environments that are being used, and they're full of conference rooms with tables and chairs. Um, I've even seen one where there was like a ridiculously big conference room so that uh, they could accommodate like, I don't know, 40 people and everyone was basically five meters apart. So so the, the need to have a conference table for which there's actually no need at all, um, except as some kind of basic element to organize space, um, ended up determining a virtual layout that was really terrible for virtual space. So, so it's just skeuomorphism. And I'm very much looking forward for the designers of these this worlds to do what you just said, which is to think more not so much of the subject as a general participant in this virtual world, but for the virtual subject. Because I feel like there are very important needs between what does a physical subject need in the physical world with a biological body, and what does the subject need when they are in VR with a virtual body which moves and has very different affordances and needs than your biological body. Um, and that means the the moment you bring that into the design process, the avatar, um, you might find many original answers to the things like the concept of a conference room table or how you organize space um, in a room without a classical skeuomorphous conference room table. Do you think in the near term, as virtual reality is kind of going from this niche enthusiast position into the wider market, there's a kind of short-term need for skeuomorphism for familiarity? Or do, do you think that the only way to get to the wide market and kind of show the unique benefits to VR is to start from the position of let's design for these spaces and throw away the familiar ideas that are in people's head about what spaces should look like? I think there's room for all of that. I think there's always going to be a more experimental crowd that's going to cheer the moment they find a virtual world where things are completely wacky. And there's always going to be a crowd that um, wants to to focus on other things in VR and does not want to be challenged by the environment. Um, but to answer your question about skeuomorphism, I use skeuomorphism sometimes, but I try to um, I try to use it strategically. For example, um, in classical video games, you always change the level by going into things like an elevator, right? Because everyone everyone knows, okay, I'm in an elevator. So the right thing to do in an elevator is to just wait for a little bit. Um, and that's just a wonderful, clever way to have someone wait for a bit without creating any kind of confusion while you're doing things in the background. So it's actually a clever, it's, it's, 
it's skeuomorphism because it's an elevator and has no meaning really in VR. It has no actual functionality except on this level of UI and UX. So that kind of skeuomorphism, um, when used strategically, I think it's extremely clever. So I would like to see more of that um, as opposed to skeuomorphism out of more like intellectual laziness or oh, we only have two days left to design this conference room let's just buy in some chairs and tables from like turbo squid and then we're done one of the things that's absent in these virtual spaces as you mentioned earlier is gravity but it strikes me that the other thing that's different is scale so in the real world we are always at our same scale you know we don't have the ability to become giants or become you know mouse size at any point but in a virtual space, you could see it allowing the avatar to become enormous or become tiny and occupy different spaces that interact with each other at different scales. Is that something you think about? Is that something that you could see being part of the future of VR? Yes, absolutely. And I think of that and we're even experimenting with some environments um, that play on that. So it's basically the Alice in Wonderland uh, fantasy. and that actually is a concept that requires that we really change the way we think about architecture and environments because normally as you said there is this very static relationship between you in your biological um shell and architecture um and it's only in very very rare cases that the actual physical architecture moves or does something um but in VR, the moment the, the scale changes, it introduces a dynamism, dynam dynamism that is absolutely fascinating. And, and the question is, um, if, even such a thing of, do you shrink or does the building get bigger, right? And the answer is kind of irrelevant. It's like kind of can be both or take your pick. Um, but then what how do we define this new relationship because it's a new relationship between you and the enclosure and the environment um and it put it it can put you into unexpected situations right so all of a sudden i am tiny so i wanted to go over there and i thought it would take me like two teleport jumps and now i'm discovered it might take me 10 minutes if i have no other means of of navigating this space um so all of a sudden, it's kind of like an unexpected situation that the environment puts you in, not the story, just the environment that is now dynamic. Um, and that is just quite wonderful. And that's exactly the kind of concepts that opens up um, the possibility for what we would like to call virtual architecture as a distinct discipline as an, and as a distinct line of thinking from traditional architectural design in the far future when these are equivalent in terms of the scale and the amount of people in the economy that they serve do you see university education for these things as being starting on the same path and diverging as choice or do you see these as being completely different educational sectors i've been having a lot of conversations with um different universities and university departments around the world and talking to their students, um, trying to get a conversation going about exactly the same, this, this issue. And we, we, what right now we are seeing, of course, traditional architecture schools um, having to deal with an environment where architects have to add things like coding and game engines to their skill set not just because of vr but even within architecture a lot of rendering for example of buildings is now being done in game engines um, and as soon as architects have that as a skill that they acquire in school all of, a, all of a sudden it opens up the possibility for them to also get into vr or start to combine them um, and on the other hand we see as well universities that have nothing to do with architecture or don't even have an architecture department, but they are very strong in teaching um, graphic computer graphics that are now having um, VR, AR departments and, and offering courses on these subjects and having their people 
uh, training their students into narrative techniques, for example, for these immersive technologies. So who is going to end up designing the metaverse? Um, are architects going to take that and incorporate it into the traditional discipline of architecture? Or are these special people that are just trained to think about spatial narrative techniques um, going to take that over and they will become the masterminds and the architects of these worlds? Um, I, I don't know yet which way things are going. As, an, as a traditionally trained architect myself, of course, I would like to see more and more traditional architects come in uh, because I do believe we have an understanding of the relationship between space and behavior that is quite unique and that traditionally is taught and learned through the history of architecture. Um, but yeah, as I said, these other, this other kind of departments and courses and university from outside architecture are um, stepping up to the challenge, sometimes much faster than architecture schools, and sometimes with amazing um, curriculum and, and ideas on how to, how to teach people about these new, new issues. So you spoke a bit about traversing through these spaces and kind of how that matters, because, you know, in real life, you either, in m most cases, you're walking with your feet or you may be using some sort of personal vehicle. But in VR, there are many ways to traverse through a space from sliding with a thumbstick to teleporting or even spaces that are designed to only be the size of your physical room, such that there is no artificial movement required at all. What are your thoughts on, on the relation between how we move through virtual spaces and, and their design and how that impacts the user? I find all the current means of locomotion that we have in, in VR very unsatisfying. I, I believe there is so much room for experimentation in this. And it almost feels to me like VR and these virtual worlds are a bit more advanced than we are, that they provide us with this endless space, which is just mind blowing. And we are still, we are still stuck with the limitations of, of remnants from our physical bodies and our physical world. And we still like jump around or we can't move too fast because we get sick. And of course, these virtual worlds are creating for us. So they should be serving us and our needs. So um, I'm like many other people, I'm very much against creating things that are not accessible or that make anyone sick, of course. But there's also a part of me that feels a bit challenged in a good way. We are so used to living in this planet where we feel like we're the kings of the jungle, right? And we do whatever we want and we conquer everything. And yet when I'm in a virtual space, I feel challenged. I feel like the space is offering me opportunities that because of my limited ability to travel fast without being sick or to fall down heights or to 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 perceive things from multiple directions in the same time it's i i feel i feel limited i feel small i feel like i need to almost develop new kind of resources and senses and and magic abilities so that i feel more at home in in this virtual world and i feel and i think that is part of the challenges that that these universes offer us. And I, I know people who are not interested in these challenges. They they are completely, they go down the road completely of, well, it should be human-centric design. Um, it's always the product that should be serving us and accommodating to us. It's not like we should change to adapt to it. But the reality is that we do change to adapt to technology all the time, even if in the beginning, it seems like everything, every button, every move is made to accommodate us. The other way around is, is, is also actually taking place. It's just much harder for us 
one, to identify how we are being changed by technology, and two, on a psychological and even moral level, to admit that technology is changing us. And on top of that, we even have a hard time understanding how. Are there any cultures from the past, as far past as it may be, that their architecture you think has useful lessons that can be brought into virtual spaces? Or do you think there's, there's nothing in the history of physical architecture that is sort of more relevant? Oh, very interesting. Um, I think the answer is yes. And I've been reading some articles that go way, way, way back and try to analyze the spatial production of things like certain kind of tribes or, or people that um, used to live a long time ago. So I've even been looking at architecture from an archaeological perspective. And you have these um, studies that try to understand based on archaeological remains or places like where, where we discovered ashes, so we knew where they were making fire and we've discovered the footprint or, of some ancient buildings. And the studies are trying to reinterpret the organization of daily life and spatial behavior in those cultures um, according to the, these, these layouts, these architectural layouts. And the truth is that other cultures in other times um, organized their life differently and organized their societies differently. Um, and that was seen in the space and even promoted through space. And I very much would like to see things like social VR worlds start to introduce that element, start to use different concepts for the spatial layouts um, that promote different way in which members of these virtual societies, let's call them that way, start to relate to each other, start to organize themselves in, in, in ways that we have, we are not seeing in the physical world. So it's, for me, anthropologically, also quite, quite an interesting thing because right now I go into places like VR chat and I still see very traditional rooms and very traditional hallways and people replicating a, a, a com the organization of their community, their virtual community, is trying very hard to replicate that of physical communities. Um, but I feel like there's there's something that could go beyond that. And we could see also through different approach through spatial design and virtual architecture, we could be, start to witness the emergence of different social behaviors and ways of organizing communities. What strikes me is that if you look at the avatar design in VR chat, these are avatars that in many cases don't mirror anything to do with the real world. And, you know, they, they have these kind of unique ideas of how to represent themselves. But yet, as you say, when they come to representing the space, they go back to these kind of traditional staples. Why do you think that is? It's much easier to recognize things and needs and changes when it comes to to yourself. We also live in a culture that encourage that quite a lot. Of course, it depends on kind of the kind of bubble that you live in. But um I see I see a lot of um I see a lot of change in that direction. So there's a lot of discussion about allowing people from all walks of life to freely express themselves in all ways, not just in terms of freedom of speech, but also in terms of what they look like and how they identify in terms of the gender. So there's there's a lot of public conversation um, going on in these directions, but there is not that much public conversation that happen around these same issues, but when it comes to space, it's a much, much more difficult issue to tackle and to, to address. So what would that conversation look like? Well, I don't know. It would be someone saying things like, I feel like the layout of my apartment is negatively impacting my life. Now, for some reason, we don't really hear that many people making that statement, but probably it's a, a it, it's something a lot of people should be making because 
the layout of their apartment unless they live in some kind of sprawling mansion is probably negatively impacting their life and their reason their reasons maybe why it was poorly designed maybe their economic reasons as well but um we're just not having that discussion as often as we should and it's a difficult discussion to have but if we move things now into the virtual space all of a sudden it's maybe a little bit easier to talk about that because it's also a little bit easier to imagine and suggest changes to that. If a friend of mine tells me the way the size of my kitchen is negatively impacting my life, then um, I can't do that much to change it unless they allow me to design a new house for them. But if someone says my virtual environment um, doesn't quite fit me, I, I have this amazing new avatar that I designed for myself and um, it feels so liberating, but somehow this virtual room that I'm in does not equal that feeling. Like it, I feel like it should be something more. Um, then I can definitely help with that. Uh, and we can explore new forms of expression for the room, just the way they explore that for their own avatar. So so part of the reason is is it's hard to get into this conversation and this conversation about space and how it impacts our life is not as central in our culture right now. Could part of the problem be that so many people now are renting for perpetuality? They don't have ownership of the spaces that they're in in the real world, whereas they do have ownership over their identity and themselves and their bodies. Absolutely, yes. So... If you are fortunate to be part of a financial elite, right, then you absolutely hire the best architects you can find, pay them a lot of money and spend years designing your mansions together with them. And these people absolutely think of their houses as, as a manifestation of their personal style and identity, right? But this is something such a small percent of the population can afford to do. Um, and I would, without falling into the dystopia of proposing that um, poor people can have mansions in VR, which I have heard people uh, suggest, and I think that is absolutely sad and dystopian, um, I would rather like to think of VR as a first step towards at least practicing and acknowledging that space is as much as your avatar part of your personal style and personal expression and start as a first step start to play with that in the virtual world do you see innovations and ideas that start in virtual architecture coming into the real world? You know, do you see it going the other direction as well as just kind of real world ideas coming into the virtual? This is something that I talk a lot about when I am a guest in podcasts and events um, that belong to the AEC community that stands for architecture, engineering, and construction. So that world, that is not really interested in, in virtual space per se, but um, but in how it intersects, how it could potentially intersect with actual architecture and actual construction. And there is one thing that for me, that has, that is becoming more and more obvious um, to me, which is the following. When you design things in VR as an architect, of course, with the intention of at some point building that space, right? So you can't design floating things, um, but you use virtual space as a um, as a way of prototyping and sketching out things. The big advantage of that is that you do it at one-to-one -one scale, which for an architect is something uh, absolutely unbelievable. I mean, we were never, ever, ever able before to to plan and design at one-to-one -one scale we always did it through cardboard models or 
sketches and little drawings. So they were always a scaled down abstraction of what was in our minds. So now my theory is that when we design at one-to-one scale, we actually start to make decisions that we would have never made in these hand drawings or in these little models because our brain um, follows different cognitive workflows and paths. Um, and that is starting to happen to me when I use VR for real architecture projects, which is I sketch in the virtual space. And then when I take the headset off and I look on the screen on what I've done, sometimes I'm shocked. Sometimes um, I realize that I have placed walls in certain configurations and angles that I would have, which is something that I would have never done had I, had I drawn that by hand or had I, had I been working with, with cardboard or some other means that's not one-to-one. Um, and that, and if you take that a step further, say, okay, we design these spaces that start to have some very unique stylistic elements that would have never been born without VR. And then we build that, we are absolutely gonna start to see a wave of buildings and architecture that we've never seen before in terms of, in terms of style. And that is tremendously exciting in terms of the physical world and how the physical world is gonna look. Do you see these kind of tools also opening up architecture to a new kind of audience of people, maybe a concept of an amateur architect becoming a thing going into the future with these three-dimensional tools? Yes, absolutely. And that is exactly what I'm working on with my company right now. We are designing a virtual standalone creation tool that will allow people that do not have a professional training to start designing things, either things that will stay in the virtual worlds that can be used as virtual environments or things that are meant to one day be built. Because a lot of the things that limit people to design their own architecture is exactly what I was talking about earlier, which is this the fact that you have to always use an abstraction to express the building you have in your mind. You have to always draw and not that many people can draw or draft. And you go to architecture school to learn about drawing conventions and symbols that you use. And it's all because until VR, we just couldn't really do it at one-to-one scale. We had to represent it. So now. The, the symbolism is gone. There's no need for drawing conventions anymore. So why wouldn't regular people be able to make very interesting and informed design decisions and architectural decisions? So yeah, that's exactly what, what we're working on. And um, it's quite wonderful and exciting. Tell us a bit more about your company. You are a successful founder of a virtual reality company providing these architecture and training services. T- tell me about the journey of finding this company and sort of the journey so far. Our company is a little bit special in that we continue to do physical building. So we design physical building as well as virtual environments and virtual applications. And We never want to give up either of those two areas. Um, People tell me quite a lot that it's a bit of a crazy proposition because, of course, the kind of knowledge that's needed in getting a physical building designed and built is very different than the kind of knowledge, including programming, that's needed to design a virtual application, right? And how can you have Um, how can one team or one person cover so much terrain, right? It's um, so, so, so things, questions come up like, well, but which one are you really good at? And Hmm. for me, this is the complete 
it's the complete wrong approach, the wrong way to look at things. I believe in the future, these isolated disciplines are going to dissolve because the paradigm of our time is um, coding and technological change. And every discipline will have to engage with that at some level. And you absolutely, it's, and, and it would be mandatory to engage with it and to have skills that involves coding to some extent um, if you want to do cutting edge work in any discipline. You can even look at what's happening in medicine and you can see heart surgeons are now training to use this like remote robotics to, to perform these things. And the ones that are at the cutting edge of this technology are actually the ones that are even involved with coding and, and developing part of those applications and technologies. Um, so I'm hoping that soon I will not get these kind of questions anymore. No one will ask me, well, are you a coder or are you an architect? And it's going to be obvious that I am just both and I can do both quite well. And the excitement or the value of our project uh, comes from the fact that we do do both and we are pushing things, um, pushing things in this direction. So what's what's special is also the fact that we don't have the traditional multidisciplinary teams where you have a programmer that works with an architect um which by the way it's a perfectly perfectly good way to work um but we actually have architects that also code so we are kind of two in one and we find that the kind of conversations that we get into are just quite different and quite exciting than, than the kind of conversations where you have to have the programmer explain something to the designer and the designer explain something to the programmer and things get lost in translation. Although towards the end, of course, some amazing product can still, um, can still happen. So, so we, we have this, these workflows that can be quite interesting. For example, I could be working for a few weeks on a, on a physical building. And in my head, everything that I see and do, including in VR, has to function under the assumption that this is going to one day be a real wall. And then I, will, I would switch to working for a few weeks on a virtual reality environment. And then that wall, like, I touch it, I touch, I touch it like this, and I say, okay, this will always be a virtual wall. So I have to really switch my mindset and design this and treat this in a very, very different way. And I have come to quite enjoy this, this challenge and this change in perspective. And I feel like it's what's, again, what's giving us and the work that we produce a certain edge. I love this idea of kind of multidisciplinary approach on an individual level rather than just a corporate level. Do you think that as we go into the future and sort of education tools become better and the wealth of human knowledge becomes easier for any person to digest, you know, you use labels like designer, programmer, architect. Do you think this idea of people having a label like that will go away and kind of people may just be determined by the nature of their work rather than by the approach that they take to it? Yes. I think I don't see a purpose in the future for these labels anymore. They are abs obsolete for me. And I also don't see any immediate need to find new labels. I think there's a lot more freedom in not having this this label or in coming up with new labels or or in defining people and activities using a different kind of terminology um and this also ties into your earlier question about education i think part of the reason why education is in such a big crisis right now and they enter this crisis even before um the pandemic is because they the, their whole structure is predicated on this idea of these labels 
and these departments. And when they do push collaborative projects, they're all based on this concept of collaboration and of being interdisciplinary in the team, but that's not good enough anymore. We need to train people across this discipline in a true kind of fashion. We need to dissolve these individual departments and we need to foster multiple directions within the same person. Otherwise, we will always really struggle to, to come up with answers um, to the complexity of our times. So a while ago, you made some very interesting comments about storytelling in, in VR. And, you know, this, it's really struck me because I, I've never seen this kind of vocalized before, but, but I think you really did make a great point in that a lot of the storytelling in traditional mediums, the setting is, much, is as much of the storytelling as the narrative and the progression itself, because, you know, you aren't by default immersed into an environment, whereas in VR, you start fully immersed in this environment and, you know, as you said, what's next? I, I'm quite an avid reader. And since I became so involved with VR, I've started to process everything that I read in terms of both form and content from the perspective of VR. So I could be reading something like, I don't know, a novel about some love story or I don't know what, something from the 19th century. And in the back of my mind, I'm always trying to find parallels between that and, and VR. So how, would, how, would, how, how well would that form of the, the form that that particular writer is using to create this narrative and to to, to involve me emotionally, um, how well would that adapt to VR? And if you take almost any novel, you will immediately see that it would just not adapt very well at all. Some of the authors that I admired the most, um, authors like Marcel Proust, for example, spends up to 30 pages describing um, the sparkling water of a forest stream or the beauty of the sun rays coming through in this beautiful raking light um, through the leaves of an oak tree. And it involves you emotionally because they add so much detail to that. And they take that approach with a lot of things. But in VR, well, you can just put a player under an oak tree with the raking light and they will get it. And if it's beautifully rendered, they might even feel a bit of emotion within a millisecond, right? So I also, I also realized that, of course, these descriptions play a very important role in these books, which is they are really tangled together um, in a bundle. And in that bundle, they also place the story and they also place your emotional attachment to certain characters. So they're being very strategic about these long, quote unquote, boring descriptions. They come as strategic moments in the story. So sometimes you need them and they, they add up to some point where you feel quite a lot of like, you feel like you experience the sublime, you experience or, or dramatic, some dramatic feeling if someone, something just happened to someone, but in that time, you're also standing on the wooden floor or some of some kind of hut, or you are on a cliff and I'm, I was wondering how could VR put you in that position without all this other stuff? And in 90% of the cases, I found that this other stuff, it's not really, it's not really needed. You can just put the person there and they will just experience it. 
Um, and you can be clever about what you show them. So if you need characters, you can show things like a child is running by and you've just seen that child do something else. So that will immediately start some associations in your mind. Or you can have some kind of piece of someone's dress that's a particularly bright shade of red and you recognize that somewhere on the ground. So so we don't leave characters and story behind, but this happens way, way faster when you have the visual, when you, when you have control over the visual environment. So, so how do we tell stories then when we have so much power at our fingertips and people can make associations within milliseconds just by seeing this very carefully located clues or very quick animations or a glimpse of a character. So what, what is this new form of, of storytelling? Kind of tangentially related to this idea that these books kind of spend this time explaining these little details almost in a sense to place you, what makes a place unique is often nothing to do with any of the macroscopic features, but it's the little things that people notice that are almost very subtle. How, how do you think that kind of is related to the design of virtual spaces? To go back to my previous example, um, I think that when you have so much control over the visuals and these immersive type of visuals that we have in VR, the way in which you create these emotional attachments change, they're different. So, so I mentioned seeing a piece of a cloth that looks like it was ripped off from someone's dress. I'm pretty sure that for almost all the players that are in your environment and they're attentive to what's happening, it's enough for them to see this once or twice to start noticing and start to create a potential narrative and, and start to search for explanations in their mind. And all you did is drop on the floor a little piece of ripped cloth, right? And, and then you show that maybe again in another context, and then your players have two dots that they need to connect. And all of a sudden, you will have them chasing potential storylines and chasing potential understanding of what is going on and connecting the dots and even starting to have, based on their personal experience, certain kind of tendencies to interpret things one way or, the, or another. Um, and again, this is a few milliseconds that would bring you description, immersion, storytelling, narrative, some type of emotional involvement immediately. So that's already like 50 pages of the book. So we have to find new strategies and move things in a different way, move things forward in a different way and, and find a new type of sp speed and pace for, for these things. Do you think one of the difficult aspects of this could be that part of the answer is giving less control to the storyteller and having more of the story emerge from the players, not just their actions, but their kind of interpretation of the story up to that point? This is also something that we are starting to see some level of experimentation in with um, degrees of of control and again the relationship between you as the player and the environment that you're in so of course a book is a very passive thing in that you can read it a hundred times and it's still going to be the same book although you might have you might be able to come up with different kind of insights every time you read it again but you have no power to to change it in any way. So your own personal story and interpretation of it does not change it in any way. But now we absolutely have the potential to 
design experiences that allow us to not, well, to change it in some way. So I don't know what, what form that is exactly, but for me, that's a bit of the Holy grail where I am in a world that can, that, that makes me believe that my actions and my particular story and who I am affects change into that world because that is what that is the relationship that we have also with real life as well I mean as individuals and as agents we have unbelievable power right in the physical world you can go and destroy something you can go and say something to someone that might completely change their day or change their year or change the next 10 years of their lives in other positive or negative sense. So we have an Im immense amount of control over other people and over our environments. So being able to create VR stories that have us engage with the story, even with 1% of that kind of agency is going to be quite revolutionary. So tell me about the project that you're currently working on or that you're going to be working on in the future, in the, in the near future, that you're most excited about. We have two things that we've been working on um, for quite a while, and they are our two long-term projects. One I've already mentioned briefly, which is this VR creation tool for architectural design. And we are confident that we can get the UI and the US quote unquote right enough so that people without a without a background in, in architecture can feel confident and excited about designing things. And the second project is a a virtual game that is going to tackle some of the things that I've been talking about and some of my my personal desires for for rethinking what a narrative in VR is and the whole idea of agency and and the relationship between you as the player or the avatar and a dynamic kind of environment, which we also talked about in the beginning with this architecture that can shrink and move and change scale. So all of that hopefully will find some kind of expression in this game that we are developing. Can you tell us anything about the game yet or are you keeping the details under wraps for now? Yeah, most of the details are under wraps. One thing I can say is that the overarching narrative and, or, and, and type of artistic direction is um is based on the hard sci-fi genre i'll definitely be keeping an eye on it then i'm, I'm a big fan of the hard sci-fi genre myself so what are your hopes fears concerns and questions about this entire vr ar industry in the next three to five years i personally hope we will solve what i believe is quite a dramatic issue right now which is the fact that a lot of content creators are having a hard time finding finances, accessing, accessing enough money to allow them to be extremely experimental. I think we are seeing some progress being made um, in terms of commercial applications and uses of VR for training, but it will need some of the best minds the community can attract involved in highly experimental things to really push this to the next level. And we've only tackled a few questions um, that we have no answers to, but that we feel like are just so full of potential and creativity and excitement. But they, there are a host of other issues it's it's a huge never-ending almost list and right now we don't even have a proper way to distribute basically the, these kind of experiences even when 
someone does manage to figure it out financially and get some amazing experimental application done. Right now, these are being shown at festivals like Tribeca, which luckily now is has moved online, but it's just too, too limited. And we see very few funds open up competitions um, for creators like this. And a lot of people are fighting for very, very little money and really struggling. And some have to go and engage with huge compromises. So I'm hoping we'll see more progress on this front. Thank you for joining us. It's, it's been a pleasure and it's been really interesting to hear your thoughts and perspectives on this industry. Thank you so much for having me. It was great chatting with you.